Great, thank you so much, Kathy. If you've got a Bible, please um, keep it open at 1 Peter, um, 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to have a look at that uh, chapter together. Um, as a church, we have a, a vision statement uh, that begins with uh, these words, um, that we want to encourage one another to be captivated by Christ. That's the opening statement of our vision. We want to encourage one another to be captivated by Christ. And on this Easter Sunday, I thought it would be great to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, which has a passage which tells us how we can greatly rejoice and be filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't feel like you're greatly rejoicing. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't feel filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Well, if that's you this morning, I, I trust that this message will help you. I trust it will be an encouragement for us. Because in this passage of 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter shows how we can live as Christians in a living hope that isn't a dead orthodoxy, where we just tick the right doctrines and say the right things. Or it's not just a faith which is a fading memory of glories past, when we remember what God did do many years ago, but is a living hope for today. And so today, what I want to do is unpack the three tenses of the gospel. That is, that we can have a living hope now in the present that includes a future in heaven that is guaranteed by a resurrection in the past. That's what we're going to walk through today. The hope that we have in the present, which includes the future, which is based on the past. We're going to try and take a 360 degree view of it. Um, one writer looking at these verses, when he talks about true worship and wanting to know God deeper, he says this, worship is when the mind apprehends great truths about God and the heart kicks in with deep feelings of brokenness or wonder or gladness or admiration and gratitude and the mouth says something like, blessed be God, oh blessed and praised and honoured and glorified be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's my prayer today. So let's pray and ask God's Spirit to fill our hearts as he opens our eyes. Father, we pray now that as we come to your word, that you would fill us with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Our heart's desire is to see Jesus. Our heart's desire is that the Spirit's work would be shed abroad in our hearts as we see and feel and know your love more. So, Father, please bless the children in Sunday school this morning and bless us as we sit under your word. And we pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, the first point this morning is this. We have a living hope now. We have a living hope now. Now, at the moment, I am in the middle of the most expensive month in the Thomas household. This is a very expensive uh, month in our house, mainly because of gifts. So there's a period of four or five weeks in our house where it starts with my birthday. That's the most expensive of all. It starts with my birthday. Then it goes to our wedding anniversary. Then it comes to Easter. Then on the 15th, it comes to my wife's birthday. And then if you extend the, the month a little bit, it also includes one of my son's birthdays as well. So it's just a mega expensive month. But it's also a wonderful month. It's a great month of gift giving and gift receiving. And I really enjoy getting gifts and giving them. I'm meant to say that as well, aren't I? It's just as good to give as to receive. But anyway, I love receiving gifts. It is wonderful. Well, today in this passage, we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that there is a gift that we have been given. And it is an amazing gift. It's a gift of new birth, new life, eternal life. You see, for the Christian, eternal life isn't what happens when you die, but rather eternal life is what starts when you're converted. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But the moment you become a Christian, your life now is eternal. And eternal in the Bible isn't just about the quantity of time, but the quality of time. It's not just about the fact that you live forever, but now you are known by the Father. So that's what John prays in John chapter 17, that eternal life is knowing the Father. That's why today, hopefully, you've had some Easter eggs. The Easter eggs are there to remind us of new birth, new life. You see, part of the Christian message is that whilst life in many senses is great and there's lots of happiness in life in many ways, even a successful life, 
even a prosperous life, even a healthy life, even an academic life or a life where you succeed in work, even those great lives, if we don't know Christ, we're like a bird with one wing. You can have a bird with one wing who can flap that wing and really move with some speed in circles, but ultimately you're circling. It may feel great and look great, but actually you're missing out on something huge, true life, eternal life. There's a sense in which becoming a Christian is like having that second wing given back to you, where now you don't just flap around in circles, but you soar on eagle's wings, you fly. And the great news of the Easter weekend is that on Good Friday, that first Good Friday, Jesus died on our behalf, having lived a perfect life so that we can go free. But more than that, on Easter Sunday, remember that he rose from the dead to give us new life. Let me give you some of the things you get in this two-winged life where you saw. I mean, I could spend the whole sermon giving you examples of these. Let me just give you a few. One is forgiveness. Someone who trusts in Christ because Jesus has lived for them and died for them and risen from the dead knows true forgiveness. And therefore, the ability to sleep in peace and have a clear conscience. You see, when your life is based on another and another who was perfect, you never have to worry about whether it's enough, whether you're good enough, whether you've done enough. Actually, if it's all based on Jesus, you can sleep well because you are forgiven. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to never have to worry whether you've done enough to earn forgiveness. Christ has done it all. On that first Good Friday, he said a number of things on the cross, but one of them was this, paid in full. If you want to know true forgiveness, trust in Christ. Or you can live life with one wing, just going around in circles, hoping you'll earn forgiveness. But you'll never really know, will you? But Jesus, he earns it all. Let me give you something else we get. We get love. And the experience of knowing that we're loved and accepted no matter what. Often people will come into our life and say, yeah, you're accepted no matter what. No matter what you do, I will always love and accept you. But, but usually there is a line, isn't there? And even if their love doesn't go, you do annoy them. But with God, there's a love that we can never be separated from. A love that never fails. A love that never leaves us. Because you see, God's love was, was given to us. He loved us before we were his, before we'd done anything we could have, because it's all based on him. And the Bible says this, look, if God was willing to give his only son when you were his enemy, how much more now, having been adopted into his family, will he love you forever? We have love. Another thing we have is purpose. We now are a child of God and we have a mission to life. You see, going back to that church vision statement, the reason we want to be captivated by Christ, that's what we want to do for encouraging one another. We want to be captivated by Christ so that Christ will spill out into our life and we will be a part of a spirit-filled church. What that means is we'll be a church where there's love, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, where we always look out for other people. Love is huge, isn't it? Some of you will know George Verwer. Uh, George Verwer started a mission organisation called OM, Operation Mobilisation, and has a, an impact on Christians all around the world. George Verwer at the moment is on palliative care, and yesterday he released his last video um, as he prepares to go and be with the Lord. And George Verwer says this in his video. He says, what do I want my legacy to be for the next generation? Answer number one, love. Some of you will remember his book, Revolution of Love. Because as someone who has been all around the world, has seen thousands of people come to faith, seen hundreds of thousands probably of Christians step up in the faith, he's realised that the key thing is love. It's a wonderful thing. There's stories that the Apostle John, in his older years, just used to go around the congregation, stand in the pulpit and say, little children, love one another. Now, I don't know if that's true, but if you read his epistles, it seems like it could be. The wonderful thing for Christians is because we know this inexhaustible love, that love spills out into the church. And then our hope as a church is that we wouldn't just have a spiritual filled church, but we would love the community with the Father's love. That that spilling out would spill out even more. 
So we have a purpose that comes out of the love. But there's so many other things I could go on. I could talk about the gift of prayer. I could talk about the gift of joy. But there are so many parts of becoming a, a Christian. You are united with Christ. You have eternal life with him. I, I wonder, have you received that gift yet? It's the greatest gift of all. Um, every once in a while, it happens very rarely, it might have happened to you, every once in a while, at Christmas, a present gets left behind a tree and you miss it. Has that ever happened? Even more rare, every once in a while on an Easter, an egg gets left at the back of a cupboard where you've hidden it. I tell you what, finding that egg at the end of May, oh, that's the glorious one, isn't it? But friends, are you missing out on the gift of eternal life? Do you know, don't miss out. It's the best gift ever. And so he says there's a gift of eternal life. And he goes on and he says this, look, you have this, this gift is out of God's great mercy, verse 3, and you're given a new birth into a living hope. You know, I, I think uh, Christianity gets a lot of bad press and most of it is deserved. Um, Christianity does get a lot of bad press and most of it is deserved. Lots of people think that Christians are just uh, boring and, and that's because most Christians are just boring. We, I remember one guy, a good friend of mine, coming to speak in a Christian union. And he's a really good friend of mine. I'm not going to name him because you don't know him. But I, Well, I can because you don't know him. His name's Rodri. And he came to preach in the, in the Christian union and he was talking about this joy we have as Christians. And he says, you know, as Christians, we should have a deep joy, a really deep joy. It's just really deep in my life and you can't see it on my face. It was the best sermon I've ever, I've ever heard. But friends, people should be able to see that we have a living hope. It's not a dead orthodoxy. It's not just historic. It is true now. And this living hope that we have that bubbles up in our life, when you look down at verses 6 and 7, it's a living hope that happens even in difficulties. Have a look at this. It says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. There's a difference between happiness and joy, isn't there? So happiness depends on our happenings. If everything is happening the way I need it to happen, I can be happy but there's something about joy that means it's above happenings so joy is a deeper happiness that doesn't depend on happenings so there are times in life where as a christian you won't be happy but you will have joy a deep joy and we need to see that there is a living hope for all of life on offer the great thing about the christian faith is when you become a christian you get a gift of eternal life. You get this living hope. And because of that, it's, it's a bit like those gifts you get that, that keep on giving. Do you know the gifts that keep on giving? Uh, years ago, I used to love having magazine subscriptions for Christmas. Uh, my brother-in-law particularly used to get me magazine subscriptions. I loved it because for the rest of the year, every month, you get a magazine. Um, one of my favorite birthday presents this year, I had lots of great birthday presents, but one of the ones I've really enjoyed is a coffee subscription. It's great, isn't it? Because I get bags of coffee from people, which I love. Take note, next year, March 26, if you want to buy me a bag of coffee, that's lovely. <laughs> um, but the bag of coffee comes to an end. But um, Sean and Emily in work, they bought me a coffee subscription. So once it finishes, I'm going to get another one through the post. It's brilliant. And you know, the gift of eternal life is a subscription gift. Not one that you have to work to and pay. That's what I think most people think, you see. We think our faith is a subscription. As long as I'm good enough, as long as I love Jesus enough, as long as I keep up on my holiness, I'll be okay. No, no, no. It's a subscription paid for. So his grace comes and comes and comes and comes. His love comes and comes and comes and comes. It never runs out. So friends, we have a living hope now. But secondly, we have a living hope now that includes a future in heaven. It's so important as Christians to remember that it's not just about now that we have a hope, but we have a hope for eternal life. Eternal life goes into eternity and it is wonderful. One of my favorite passages to read to people when they're particularly unwell or when they're in their last hours of life is Revelation 21. I'm sure you know it really well. 
but I've lost count of the number of times I've sat next to someone's bedside and I've read these words from Revelation 21 and verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I think it's one of the greatest privileges of the Christian faith to be able to read that with someone. Not in a sense of just hoping to tell them something to make them feel better, but to read a fact, something that is true. You see, we have a living hope that affects the now that includes the future. I love this living hope that we have. It's, it's heaven. It's wonderful. One of the things that I love about that verse, which I never saw for years, do you, do you ever find that there's parts of the Bible you read, you read them for years and, and you miss the most obvious thing? I always miss the fact that the verse started with, he will wipe away every tear from my eyes. It's much better than there will be no crying. He will wipe away. It's a lovely personal nature of Christ. You see that sometimes in the Bible. Revelation chapter 1. Have you ever noticed that before when you have the vision of the risen Christ in Revelation chapter 1? On the one hand, he stands amongst the lampstands. So he stands amongst the churches. But then it also says that he holds the churches in his hand. There's a level of intimacy there. But then you read on and John falls on the floor. So Jesus puts his hand on him and says, don't be afraid. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The wonderful thing for us is we believe that eternal life is about knowing God and knowing him personally. It is wonderful. But we've got to get our concept of hope right. So the dictionary defines hope as expectation and desire combined it's an interesting thing isn't it i'm expecting i'm hoping and i desire it i'm hoping but but in a sense that kind of hope in the dictionary is not a secure thing i can hope i'll get a call up to play rugby for wales i can expect it i can desire it the way things are going it might happen <laughs> but it probably won't happen but the Bible tells us that hope is being sure of what we've hoped for. It's a certainty. It's a sure thing. And how? Well, verse 3 tells us we have this new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You see, the living hope we have now includes a future in heaven. And as we're going to see later on, it's based on a historic fact of the resurrection. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look more at this inheritance that we're going to have. Can we truly believe that we're going to go to a place where in heaven there's no more needs for hospitals? I always, I always love that, that thought. I love the NHS. I love hospitals. I think what they do is amazing. And I've got to be careful because there's an awful lot of people in our church who work in medical professions. But I do long for the day when you can't get jobs anymore. Not in this world, but I do long for the day when we won't need hospitals anymore. And that's what heaven is like. And it's interesting because when it looks at this kind of resurrection from Christ that proves this heaven, verse 4 says this, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's an interesting word to think about heaven. Heaven as inheritance. Now let me tell you about Auntie Nancy. Auntie Nancy is a real person. Um, but she's no longer with us. My Auntie Nancy was my great Auntie Nancy, and uh, she lived uh, a few villages down. When my father was born, he was one of twins, and some of you will remember in the olden days when you had twins, one of them went to, to live with the auntie. So my father went to live with this auntie. So Auntie Nancy, so my father obviously was the favourite of Auntie Nancy because for the first three or four years of his life, he'd gone to live with, with Auntie Nancy. Now, as a child, I used to love going to visit Auntie Nancy. She was lovely to me, but she had a few quirks. You know what, aunties that have a few quirks? And one of the quirks that Auntie Nancy had was telling you whether you were in or out of the inheritance. And it changed. It really did change. I've spoken to my father about this because I thought it was just a joke she used to play. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. It really changed. She used to change her inheritance dependent on whether whoever had promised to do something had done it. 
So I've got cousins and uncles who used to be petrified because they'd go down and if they kind of in passing said they were going to do something in the garden but they hadn't turned up to do it, they were out of the inheritance. It was a fascinating thing. Well, the inheritance that we have is nothing like Auntie Nancy's inheritance. Again, I, I think even as Christians we can feel like this. At one moment we can feel assured, I've done enough, I've got the inheritance of heaven, and at another point we think, I've blown it, I haven't done enough. There's not enough evidence, I can't have the inheritance of heaven. But, but friends, this inheritance that Jesus has is one that you have no matter what, because it's based on Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It's not based on ours. And when we grasp that, it gives us a beautiful assurance that will allow us to rejoice greatly even in suffering and will give us that inexpressible and glorious joy because we realise it can't be taken away. Now, Auntie Nancy did pass away and she did leave money to people. She didn't leave any to me. Anyway, we can talk about that again. But she, um, I won't tell you what I did or didn't do. Um, I think I was just the wrong generation. But, but the interesting thing is, you know, she passed away 10, 15 years ago. Now, the amount she left 10 or 15 years ago, I'm sure was an impressive amount. And probably you could have bought a house with it. But, but let me tell you this. There's a good chance that the money she left 10 or 15 years ago, you won't get a house for it now. Not a chance. I mean, the economy has moved on. And actually, there's a good chance that if you invested the money in the wrong place, that actually that money has gone. It's diminished. You know, the wonderful news of the inheritance we have here, verse 4, we have one of my favorite verses. We have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Isn't that wonderful? The eternal life that Jesus gives us, which is eternal life in heaven, but it's also a living hope now, is an eternal life, a quality of life, a knowledge of God, a personal knowledge of God that can never perish, spoil, or fade. You know, how many things in life perish? My mother, who's gone to glory now, gave me a watch. But it's perished, it's broken, it's, it's gone. It doesn't matter how much I looked after it, it just didn't last. Or how many things just spoil, or they fade. How many of you have got those photographs? Remember before digital cameras and iPhones when we used to print photos off? And how many of you have got photos now and they're, they're fading and you wish you could keep them, but they're just perishing in the sun, in light with age? The inheritance that is ours in Christ Jesus can never perish, spoil, or fade. I had a, a friend um, in, in Armonford, a lovely guy. He'd worked hard all of his life He'd worked um, in the media all of his life, and the person who looked after his branch of the media had the surname Maxwell. Worked hard all of his life, made sure he put plenty into his pension, and then one day, all gone. All gone. That's the other thing. <laughs> Inheritance can be stolen. Here's the wonderful thing. No one can steal your eternal life. Now, Peter gives us two reasons why. It's based on another, but here's your two reasons one, why. Number one, it's kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven for you. Have you ever wondered what that means? What does it mean that our eternal life, our inheritance, this living hope, what does it mean that it's kept in heaven for you? Now, you could think, well, um, Jesus is building mansions, isn't he? Let's go for New King James on this. You know, in my house are many mansions. We like that one. We'll, we'll, we'll stick to the trad for that. Does it mean that he's keeping our mansion nice and, and clean and he's putting the heating on twice a day just to make sure the pipes don't burst in heaven? I mean, is that what he means? No, no, no. What does it mean that our inheritance is in heaven? Well, who's in heaven? Jesus. If my eternal life is based on his life, death, and resurrection, then actually he is in heaven, and he is the one who has earned it, and he is there, so he is my inheritance. Do you know, it's interesting, even in Jesus' glorified body, so Jesus has ascended to heaven, hasn't he? And he's now got a perfected body. But even though he's got this glorified, perfected body, do you remember what's still on his hands? The scars. Why? Because one of the things Jesus is doing is what they call pleading the blood. He's saying, I've died for them. I've paid for them. They're mine. 
Do you know, no one can steal our inheritance. No one can take away heaven from us because Jesus has done it and he is now in heaven, preparing a place, praying for us, and he is presenting himself for us. It's wonderful what Jesus can do. And not only is there, but you look down, it's in heaven for us. Have a look down um, so no one can um, take it away. And through verse 5, we are also, through faith, shielded by God's power. That's amazing, isn't it? We are protected by God. He is shielding us. He has everything. You see, faith is believing that Jesus has done everything putting our hope in Jesus, trusting that his death is our death, his resurrection is our resurrection. And when you put your faith in Jesus, he then protects you. He shields you. Perhaps you're here this morning and you're a Christian, and if you're honest, in this season of life, you've wondered if you can make it to heaven. It's not so much that you don't trust God, it's that you don't trust yourself. It's not so much that you don't think God is able, you just don't think you're able. It's a horrendous thing, isn't it? To wonder if you can hold on long enough. It's a terrible thing. I remember as a child, I used to love climbing trees. And one day, me and some friends were climbing trees in the back garden. And as I was going quite high up in the tree, I fell backwards. And I grabbed onto the branch. And I could look down at the fall. And I knew it was going to be a really painful fall. I'd already fallen off trees and broken arms. So I knew what was going to happen. But another guy grabbed my arm. I felt like I was going to leave go and fall. But honestly, I could have left go because he was holding me. He was holding me. Friends, you might feel at the moment that you're being surrounded by things. Young people, you could be in school and you're being surrounded by temptations and struggles, or maybe you're feeling things you've never felt before, and you might be thinking, I don't know if I can keep going. Do you know what? It's not down to you. God will keep you. You see, when you look around this church and and you see the grey hair people and the silver surfers, and the white wise people, and the bald people as well. When you look at them, none of them are here because they've held on. They are here because God has held on to them. And so even if you feel like you can't make it, you can. Put your faith in Christ and he will shield you. No one can take it away. And so perhaps you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, and, and, and you dearly want to become a Christian, but you're not sure if you're good enough. You're not sure if you can keep it up. You're not sure if you can do what Christ demands. Again, let me tell you, in becoming a Christian, he's the one who gives you the power to live the Christian life. He's the one who comes to live in you and helps you to do that. Yes, it will be tough. Yes, there will be struggles, but he will keep you. If you have faith in Christ, he will keep you. But thirdly and finally, we're going to come to the end now. Thirdly and finally, we have a living hope in the present that includes a future in the past that is guaranteed by the, um, has a future in heaven that is guaranteed by a resurrection in the past. You know, Easter Sunday is so important because we go back and we look at a historic fact. Now, some of you are thinking, can I say historic fact about the resurrection? Well, I think I can. But I tell you what, if you don't think I can, can we compromise? How about I say the historic fact of the empty tomb? How about we, we, kind, of, we kind of compromise there and agree that, okay, historically we can, prove Jesus rose, uh, we can prove that Jesus lived. And it seems that when you look at the evidence, he was put in a tomb and then the tomb was empty and no one ever found the body. So the Jewish people never presented a body. The Romans never presented a body It's just that a body was in a tomb and then the tomb was empty. And for me, one of the greatest evidences for the resurrection is the empty tomb. The fact that no one ever presented a body. That Jesus had died and that Roman centurions killed him professionally. No one ever disagreed with that. And then he goes in to this tomb And then when they go on that first Easter Sunday, he's gone. For me, our hope now has to be based on fact. The danger is that we base our hope on feelings. 
Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Because the start of my sermon is, I want you to feel Christ. I want you to feel him. But then, I want to come in at the end and say, but don't base your faith on those feelings. That's the big danger of Christianity. That's, I think, the trap I fell into for the first decade of my faith. The first decade of my faith was the ultimate roller coaster ride. So I would have Sundays where I would turn up to church and think, I love Jesus, he loves me, I'm a great Christian, this is wonderful. And then there would be Sundays where I'd turn up to church and go, I can't take communion today, I don't think I'm a Christian. And it was all down to feelings, whether I felt Christ was there or not. But our faith, while it affects our feelings, isn't based on our feelings. It's based on the fact of the resurrection, that Jesus has risen from the dead. You see, we still live in this world and we live in fallen bodies and we're surrounded by sin, which means we struggle. In fact, there's a, there's a kind of battle on the inside. The New Testament teaches us that one of the ways we know we're a Christian is that you're in battle. It says that the spirit and the flesh are in battle with one another, Galatians teaches us, so that you do not know what you want. Perhaps, depends how you interpret Romans chapter 7. I'm going to go with Romans chapter 7 as the experience of the Christian. That we, we do the things we don't want to do and the things we don't want to do, we, we do. We struggle in this world. And if as a Christian we base everything on our feelings, then we'll be up and down. What we need to do is base them on the fact of the resurrection. And what that does then is, that changes our feelings. I think for the first 10 years of my life, I got it the other way. I feel Christ, therefore Christ must be alive. Whereas actually it should be Christ is alive, therefore I can feel him, I can rejoice in him. By filling your mind with the truth, it drops into your heart. And as that drops into your heart, it overflows into your life. That's why our strategy as a church is to encourage one another to be captivated by Christ. Friends, if you are struggling at the moment, can I tell you the best thing to do? Go back to the gospel. Go back to Easter Sunday. Look at the resurrection. Say, this is true. I am his. Oh, would I feel that? Would I know that together?